Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. The word performative gets used a lot in today's interview. It's with Patricia Park, author of the YA book, Imposter Syndrome and Other Confessions of Alejandra Kim. And it's about this teenager, Ale, navigating her fancy high school's world of microaggressions and allyship and race and identity Well, you know, just trying to get through high school and get into college. It's one of NPR's books we love this year, and Patricia Park talked to Here and Now's Robin Young about the negotiations Ale has to make during every single social interaction. That's ahead. Many young people today are navigating a brave new world with gender, non-conforming bathrooms, an alphabet soup of respect, LGBTQ, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, or people of color, Latinx. Oops, your best friend prefers Latino. Oh, how we got a book for them. Hilarious, heartbreaking, accepting. It's from Patricia Park, who made a splash with her 2015 debut novel, Re Jane. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, set around a Korean-American orphan from Queens. Our interview is at herenow.org. Her new book for young adults and older ones, too, is also set in Queens. Imposter Syndrome and Other Confessions of Alejandra Kim. It centers around high school senior Alejandra, or Ali, the daughter of Argentine-Korean immigrant parents who faces expectations that her origin story will make her like a Marvel comic book superhero or cause teachers to stare at her like she's a typo on the attendance sheet. What? What are you? The teachers are at an elite Quaker prep school in Manhattan where Alejandra tries to keep her head down, blend in with mostly white classmates, but a microaggression from one of her teachers forces her front and center. Again, the book is Imposter Syndrome and Other Confessions of Alejandra Kim. Patricia Park joins us now. Welcome. Hi, Robin. Thanks so much for having me back. Talk about these two identities that Ali has, Korean and Argentinian. Hmm. It is so culturally confused. And I feel like if I can draw from a food metaphor, there are these Korean empanadas that Alejandra makes with her family. It's an Argentine wrapper stuffed with Korean chapcha noodles and beef and Spanish olives. And it's just indicative of how Ale feels about her identity. She's born and raised in Queens, but her parents are ethnic Koreans from Argentina. People look at her face, they look at her name on the attendance sheet, and they cannot get it right. Well, something you're familiar with. You who are from Queens, who have (laughs) family from Korea and Argentina. Correct. But um, Patricia is one of those names that passes, I guess. And yeah, I suppose it could be Patricia. (laughs) Well, but you know about that feeling of it's enough to have one other cultural identity when you are in a world surrounded by, you know, mostly white. You felt this way in high school, as Alejandra did, and then went to Swarthmore. You kept fearing someone from the registrar's office would show up to tell you that you are a clerical era. Oh, Robin, my imposter syndrome was raging so hard when I was coming of age and even through my career. And so I did channel some of those experiences into Alejandra's story. Um, Yeah, when I showed up at Swarthmore, I was a New York City public school kid, and I felt like everybody was just speaking this fancy foreign language. And I'm like, come on, time is money. Let's go. Let's go. (laughs) Wrap it up. And when you come from Queens, which is the most ethnically diverse place with over 300 languages spoken, we have our own kind of shorthand, our own kind of language, and you have all these cultures and communities bumping up right against each other. So when I went off to this Quaker college, it was just, gosh, I felt like I was on another planet. Well, that's how Alejandra feels at times at school. It's not just about her cultural background, the daughter of immigrants. It's a story of class. I mean, most people coming into the school where, you know, people have maids and lunches that I wouldn't even have known what they were when I was in high school. Something like school lunches is so fraught. Alejandra, you know, she packs these craft cheese product on Wonder Bread sandwiches, you know, in a sea of classmates who drink kale juice and quinoa and have black garlic hummus. And this is just another way that Alejandra feels that she doesn't belong, that she has imposter syndrome, and she's just kind of struggling to get by. I also think, you know, I said it at a Quaker prep school, a very progressive school, and I feel like the conversations surrounding racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion have changed. I think we know that story of the overt racism, right? But we're starting to see that there are other kind of permutations, whether these are microaggressions or ways that characters feel otherized, and maybe they're the ones doing the otherizing. Uh, The more, as a novelist, I'm interested in being mindful about these micro moments. What are you saying about woke and how it can be both something that's necessary for us to move forward 
and exploited or abused? Well, there's this moment where Alejandra is, well, she faces a microaggression from her teacher. He he comments on the ethnicity of her name and is like, oh, you'll have no trouble getting into college, am I right? And he also says, talk about multi-culti, and he kind of laughs it off in this hipster way. And she shakes it off. She's like, no big deal. And then she starts to think all of these moments on the train where she's facing something racist happening to her. And then there's just all these bystanders where they sit back and they don't do anything. Well, here's the possible exploitation because Alejandra starts to feel the teacher's microaggression in her own time. But then a white friend seizes on it as a cause, which Alejandra resents. You know, this gets really complicated. It's a complicated world for teens and adults these days. Um, One example is when I first started writing this book, we were not using the term BIPOC. And by the time it it was already um, being published, we're now using different vernacular, different terminology. And so the world is changing so fast. And I I think, if anything, I just want to give some sympathy towards that, right? Um, You have a character like Laurel, who is the white best friend, and she picks up on the teacher's microaggression, and she starts a petition. She makes some noise behind it. And this is her form of allyship. And I see this with my students at American University. I see it with my colleagues. I think we're all just trying to figure it out, right? Like, how do you be a good ally? But how can we do it in an authentic way? Alejandra posits the way that she feels that it would be helpful versus something performative. Performative. I have to jump in there because that's what it starts to feel like. It feels as if her friend is doing this more for the gloss of being an ally to reflect on her, underscoring what a good person she is. It turns out she really is a good person. <laughs> you know, <laughs> But it gets so complicated because it starts making Allie feel like, well, wait a minute, you are exploiting what happened to me so that you can feel good. It gets complicated. Oh, it is so complicated out there. So I'm just hoping with imposter syndrome, people will read Allah's journey and and be like, oh, okay, yeah, Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, this is the way forward or this is a way forward. And maybe this can help guide me through these really complicated times. And you mentioned, you know, one of those moments was absolutely a microaggression when this failed author, by the way, who's coming to (laughs) to teach at this school. Who's um, named Jonathan, by the way, which I just just, find delightful. Just (laughs) threw that out there. When he says to her, oh, yeah, you're going to get into college, multiculti. I love, as he's saying it, you preface her thoughts with, oh, no, he's not going there. And he does go there. There's another moment where a, a woman at a college she's touring tries to communicate something to Alejandra. And Alejandra, again, is also Korean. And this woman kind of puts her hands together and bows in like a Buddhist kind of <laughs> gesture to her. And again, in uh, Ali saying, oh, no, she's not going there. Robin, believe it or not, that was not fiction. That actually oh. happened to me. I was going <laughs> to ask you, life. <laughs> how many of these have happened to you? <laughs> the rest I will neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> you say you, you are a creative writing teacher. You said you've written this for your students, many of whom also suffer from this imposter syndrome. And it's really interesting because it may be, you know, the white uh, students who are trying to be allies who are being performative at times, but it turns out that it's Allie who's being performative the whole time. She's trying to find her place in the world. And I think like for a lot of teens, uh, they're always negotiating. Do I do or say the thing that will make me belong? Or do I run contrary to that? And so for Allie, her two pulls are, you know, she's from a working class neighborhood, Jackson Heights of Queens, and she goes to this elite progressive prep school in the city. So she is constantly code switching between the two. Like She has this moment where, you know, back in Queens, if you start to use the PC terms, people think you're corny and fake. And I'm not discrediting the importance of this kind of language, but she's just, I don't know, she's just trying to be real and she's trying to figure it out. She realizes she has imposter syndrome, but actually, Robin, my secret goal with this book is that I hope BIPOC women, girls like Alejandra, BIPOC women like me, We can just stop being told we have imposter syndrome and we can just kind of make the term obsolete. When you when you finish this book, what did you finish here? Is this part of Patricia Park's story? Is this something that's helping you, too? There was definitely a catharsis as I was writing this. And my wish with writing imposter syndrome is that, hey, you know, if I could reach at least one teen out there who feels lonely, who feels like. I'm neither this nor that. What is this world I'm navigating? That's what I was hoping to do. And I write queen stories. I'm writing about minorities within minorities. I'm writing about Asian Americans. But we contain multitudes. Patricia Park's new book for young adults, 
adults will like it too, imposter syndrome and other confessions of Alejandra Kim. Patricia Park, thank you. Robin, thank you. It was a pleasure. Hi, it's Terry Gross, the host of Fresh Air. We bring you in-depth, long-form interviews with actors, directors, musicians, authors, journalists, and more. Listen to our Peabody Award-winning Fresh Air podcast from WHYY and NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Autograph Collection, part of Marriott Bonvoy. Each of the almost 300 independent hotels in the Autograph Collection are designed to be exactly like nothing else. Visit AutographCollection.com to find something unforgettable. The following message comes from NPR sponsor Mass Mutual. The Mass Mutual Foundation empowers local nonprofits to increase financial resilience in their communities. Board member Dorothy Varon reflects on the importance of connecting resources. Our goal is to activate mutuality. We want to continue to find partners who will help us support our mission and help us uh, make all the resources in our communities accessible and open to all members of the community. Visit MassMutual.com foundation to learn more.